all very welcome to all treasures. And uh, first of all, apologies for the, uh, the accommodation, just slightly cramped. We had a city council event on in the garden room, our norm, normal home. They were intentionally, they were meant to finish about quarter to one or so, but the operation ran over time. So we can't complain too much because of the fact that uh, they paid for the building. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the cat was, but, uh, so, and, uh, and a special event organized for uh, potential investors to this city. You know, so we can't really complain about that. But as a result, we're up here. And uh, so apologies for that, folks. But also, you, uh, Eamon McAnini, the director, sends his apologies. He's meeting uh, at the moment. So it's to me, down to me to introduce our speaker today. He doesn't really need any introduction. <laughs> because we're on episode two of our sort of... Uh, of our series, and uh, eagerly being looking, <laughs> look forward to looking at Ireland in the 1950s. So, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Eugene Roderick, who's going to talk about the politics of crisis. <laughs> uh, before we start, I was asked by him or by Donica to make an announcement. On Thursday the 24th of this month, there will be a lecture in the, uh, the evening lecture series, the next lecture in the evening lecture series will be held. The speaker will be Lieutenant Commander Michael Brunacardi, the commanding officer of the L.E. James Joyce, who will be speaking about the Naval Service and in particular the Naval Service's role in what was codenamed Operation Pontus, that is the rescue of, of migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. Commander Bernacardi was the Irish Naval Service liaison officer for the purposes of that and was very much involved in the entire, epi in the entire episode. So therefore, so Thursday night, the 24th of this month at 7.30, uh, is part of the museum's evening lecture series. What does Pontus mean? Pontus means bridge. Bridge. Bridge, yes. The Latin for bridge. So that's very posh in the, the, the cold. Okay, so we continue our looking at the 1950s. And I suppose maybe four little facts here might very well set the tone for what I'm going to be talking about today. It's a decade which saw 400,000 people emigrate. An absolutely phenomenal figure by any standards. By the end of the decade, by 1961, Ireland had very low wage levels, 63% of the West European average. There was economic stagnation in the country, and there was a pervasive sense of hopelessness by the late 50s. Now, that was very well captured in a cartoon in Dublin Opinion, shortly available underdeveloped country, unrivaled opportunities and magnificent views, political views, owners going abroad. Okay. Actually, I'll be happy of Crowley for these cartoons. A double Opinion was terrific for cartoons that commented on this particular period. But quite clearly, that cartoon encapsulated the mood of so many people living in the country at the time. But what is surprising is this. It's not so much what happened, it's what didn't happen. That is surprising in many ways. That there wasn't some kind of political and social upheaval in the country. Given, as I said, this sense of despondency and despair. The fact of the matter is this is that the 400,000 people who emigrated operated as a safety valve for the Irish state. When those people left, shall we say, the conditions that might have contributed to wars, social and political unrest, evaporated. And when they went, that also went. Now, this fact was, was acknowledged at the time. In 1948, the Irish state set up a commission on emigration. This commission reported in 1954. Dublin Opinion had a cartoon the day after, shortly after the first session. 
Down at the very end, you have a comment. We've got to admit that the evidence given last evening was pretty convincing. This is about emigration. You'll notice the members of the commission have all their bags. <laughs> right? They're all heading off. And I think it captures, it captures, certainly captured the mood. The truth of the matter is this. This commission, which reported eventually in 1954, really was a complete waste of time. And one has to say that. The commission looked into the causes of emigration, which were, believe it or not, no one had a job. That's why they were leaving. Okay, that's what they concluded. But also, they offered really no solutions to the problem. So the actual commission on immigration was a wonderful academic exercise, but it didn't actually progress anything. It didn't advance anything. It didn't solve anything. But it did make an observation, however. Buried in the, in the report was this observation by a Trinity College academic, the Reverend Dr. Luce. Emigration avoided that sense of urgent necessity to develop resources <coughs> rapidly and resolutely, which would have arisen if the pressure of an increasing population were operating to force the pace of development. In other words, Dr. Luce made a very simple observation that emigration was acting as a safety valve. If this country did not have emigration, therefore it would have had to, it would have had to deal with the pressure of an increasing population. 400,000 extra people would have to be catered for within the state. And that is by any standards a very significant thing. Now, I think actually, there's a, when one looks at this particular comment, I think it underscores something. Just by coincidence, I happened to be reading the other night the speech Queen Elizabeth gave in Dublin Castle in May of, was it 2011? And in the course of her speech, actually a very good speech, a really impressive speech, extremely well crafted, she made an observation. <coughs> Much of this visit reminds us of the complexity of history. Of course, the relationship, she meant the relationship between Ireland and England, has not always been straightforward. Nor has the record over the century been entirely benign. And actually, the 1950s, I think, serves to highlight just how complex our relationship with Britain has been. When she observed that over the century, the record was not benign, that, I think, goes without saying. There's been so much of our relationship that has been negative for this country. We can look at the War of Independence, we can look at the land of struggle, famine, we can go back further. But it is also a very complex relationship because the fact of the matter is this. Without the proximity to England, this country's history would have been very different because we would have been forced to address issues that we actually were able to avoid. We were actually able to avoid the very profound issues that might have arisen had 400,000 people remained in this country. Our proximity to England also allowed us to ferry off some of our difficult social problems. Unmarried mothers, the list goes on. It also allowed us to ferry off, for example, many of those who were the victims of institutional abuse. They left this country and predominantly went off to England. So the relationship with England has been a complex one. I had many aunts and uncles who emigrated to England. And what they would say is this, all of them would say this to me, that whatever they would say about England, they would say this much. When they went to England in the 1950s, they got something that they didn't get in this country. They got a livelihood. They got a good livelihood. And they were treated well, they said over those years. So therefore, as I said, it's a complex relationship. And I'm just throwing that in. History is never simple. It's never simple, really. And if it's simple, it's usually wrong. <laughs> it's as simple as that. No, but the truth is this. The truth is this, that in this time, Ireland did experience a period of some political volatility by Irish standards. Because between between 1948 and 1957, we actually had four governments. From 48 to 51, the first inter-party government. 
51 to 54, Fianna Fáil. 54 to 57, the second inter-party government. And 57 to, uh, well, 59, well, actually not to 73, we had the Fianna Fáil back in power again. Now that is in marked contrast to the history of the state before that. For the first 10 years of the state's existence, one party provided government. That was Common and Nail. From 32 to 48, one party provided government. That was Fianna Fáil. So we had what you call considerable political stability from 32 up to 48, or from 22 rather to 48, for 26 years. And then for a 10 year period, we had this political volatility. And that political volatility reflected the fact that Ireland had profound social and economic problems. And those profound economic and social problems were reflected, for example, in the fact that we had three Taoiseach in a decade. We had John A. Costello, 48 to 51, and 51 to 54 to 57. De Valera, 51 to 54, 57 to 59. And the then came in at the very end of that particular decade. So we had, shall we say, quite a lot of political turbulence and quite a lot of polit and political change. On the 30th of May, 1951, there was a general election with the fall of the first inter-party government of uh, John A. Costello. In that election, Fianna Fáil won 46% of the vote and emerged as the largest party in the Doyle with 69 seats of 73. When the Doyle met on the 13th of June, in that year, Eamon de Valera found himself elected Taoiseach once again. It's very interesting to note that the most recent biography of Eamon de Valera, written by David McCullough, you know David McCullough from RTE, he, David McCullough makes the following observation. De Valera had succeeded in returning to the Taoiseach's office. It would have been better for his place in history had he failed. Because the last 10 years of De, of De Valera's political career was not great, putting it mildly. And it has cast a huge shadow over the earlier parts of his career. It was not a very good time for De Valera. Historians have generally been unanimous in their assessment that De Valera's government from 51 to 54 was the worst Fianna Fáil government ever. Now, of course, <laughs> Historians don't go up to the 2008 census. <laughs> okay? But don't go there. Uh, in, historians, well, uh, academic historians operate the 30 year rule. The 30 year rule is this every 30 year, the state archives releases government papers 30 years after, 30 years after the government goes out of office. Okay? So, therefore, historians draw back. So they're talking about, shall we say, up to whatever time it is. There are some people, some historians would argue that this particular government of De Valera's was definitely not only the worst female fall government of, in record, but definitely one of just a dreadful government full stop. Now, this is a very serious charge to say that this is a very bad government. And the truth is this, it is very, very severely criticised as a government. And why, therefore, is it so much damned? Why is it so criticised? The basic reason is this. Ireland was facing very serious, deep-rooted problems. And the fact is, the government did not seem to have much to offer the people in terms of addressing these problems. Basically, de Valera's government didn't seem to know what to do. From 48 to 51, De Valera had been in opposition. Now, during that period of opposition, Fianna Fáil had not used the time to reflect on what it might do if it got back into power again. De Valera actually was very miffed that he lost power in 1948. And Fianna Fáil was in a state of shock. De Valera was 24 hours before the Doyle sat that it became clear De Valera would not be able to form a government. And after midnight, he was clearing out his office. And his advisors and supporters were devastated that he'd lost power. De Valera was convinced he had lost power because of one thing, 
the whims and misfortune associated with proportional representation. And proportional representation allowed the development of coalition governments. And that was de Valera's conviction. It was P.R. robbed him of his, his rightful role in government buildings. Fianna Fáil sat back and waited for the government to collapse. Actually, it lasted three years, which staggered Fianna Fáil. They thought it would last three months. So therefore, in that period, de Valera and Fianna Fáil didn't reflect. There was no reflection done. That's not unusual, by the way, in politics. It's not an unusual thing. De Valera used 48 and 51 to go off on an anti-partition tour to decry the fact that Ireland was partitioned so that he could bolster his Republican credentials. So when the cabinet was formed in 1951, it was back to the usual way of running the country. There were no new policies. Not only were there no new policies, there weren't a lot of very new ministers either, right? The Fianna Fáil cabinet of 1951 was made up of six of the ministers actually had been in government in 1932. There was no change. In fact, this Fianna Fáil, Fianna Fáil politicians, just as an aside, these, this generation had a remarkable political longevity. Sean McIntyre was in government in 1966. Frank Aiken left office in 1969. You had, you have one or two others there who are equally, uh, Jim Ryan is there somewhere, 66. Sean, Sean the Mass, 1966 also. So they had a very long political innings. The trouble is this government, when it got back into office, genuinely didn't seem to know what to do. Now the problems were enormous. The problems were absolutely enormous. So you have this incredible political <coughs> longevity, but there was a sense of continuity. A stale government offering nothing new. Also, there were other things that, affect, that affected the performance of this government. De Valera's health was not good. In 1951, in August of 1951, while in his office in government buildings, he bent down to pick up a piece of paper and his retina in his eye was detached. He went, to, he went to get medical treatment and it was sorted out. A year later, a year later, De Valera suffered a similar setback. And in August of 1952, he, with the return of his eye problems, he went off to Utrecht in Holland to see an eye specialist. He did not return to Ireland until the 29th of December, 1952. He was out of the country for all that period of time. And he was pretty much incapacitated. For the duration of his time in Utrecht, he was actually, he actually had to wear patches over his eye. And the only bit of light he was permitted was a pinprick of light to get his eyes back to normal again. So secretaries had to call out stuff to him. Sean Lemass then, as Pornishta, was later on the show. Sean Lemass, however, also suffered poor health during that period also. So there was this sense of a government drifting. Ministers who were sick seemed to be a metaphor almost for a sick country and a sick government. In, no, not just that, there was another issue, a deeper issue facing the government. And this was de Valera himself, the man who dominated the Fianna Fáil party and the Fianna Fáil government. De Valera has had many critics. That would hardly surprise any of you. Lots of critics. Some of the most stinging criticisms of de Valera in the 1950s came from a most unexpected source. A most unexpected source. Sean Lemass. In the 1960s, Sean Lemass gave a series of recorded interviews with a Dublin hotelier, Dermot Ryan. The first interview was recorded on the 12th of April, 1967, and the last one on the 9th of January, 1969. There are 23, 22, sorry, 23 interviews, lasting 22 hours, and it's 1,200 pages of transcript. 
It is an extremely important historical source that has not been mined yet by historians to any extent. In his comments, the mass is quite withering of De Valera, especially withering of De Valera from 1957 on. But in actual fact, the criticisms Lamas levied at De Valera in the late 50s could equally be applied to De Valera in the early 50s. And Lamas's assessment was this. In practice, De Valera had long ceased to be a leader in the full sense of the term. He had been the driving force in some of your political problems. He was always pressing for action in the field in which he considered it was needed. After a time, this changed. He was a man to whom you brought ideas. He became the judge of other people's ideas, rather than the initiator of them himself. And this was a most unfortunate situation at a time when the government, as I said, faced economic problems. And the root of Ireland's problems were very deep-rooted indeed. And really the problems had to do with agriculture. The only source of wealth generation in Ireland in the 1950s was agriculture. There was no other way of generating wealth in the country, really. And Irish agriculture was in a very bad way. In the aftermath of the war, after the aftermath of World War II, there had been a great expectation that Irish agriculture would go through something of an economic boom, as it happened during World War I. And Irish agriculture would actually be able to milk the golden cow over in England. That didn't happen. Food rationing continued in England into the 1950s. Not just that, the British government began giving its own farmers heavy subsidies to produce their own food. And not just that, the British government also opened up the English market to Commonwealth countries. Ireland suddenly found itself going into a very deep recession in terms of its agricultural sector of the economy. And quite frankly, when Irish agriculture went into recession, so did the rest of the economy. Because agriculture was in recession, our exports went into serious decline. We simply were exporting very little, because all we exported was agricultural produce anyway. <coughs> but we were still importing a lot into the country. So you had what's called a balance of payments problem. Too much coming in, and not enough going out. And the government would have to deal with that problem. And the man assigned the job was Sean McIntyre, the Minister for Finance. Shortly before the government was formed, Sean Lamas asked to meet De Valera. And he had one favour to ask of De Valera. Please, please, please do not put McIntyre into finance. <laughs> Just do not put him into finance. He will be a disaster for two reasons. One, McEntee was terribly conservative. Well, the mass of McEntee didn't get on at all. But McEntee was very conservative. And McEntee will do more or less what the Department of Finance tells him to do. He will not bring original ideas to this. And the other problem with McEntee was this. Is McEntee would fight for his own shadow. He'd fight for himself. He was alone in the lift. He was very confrontational, very aggressive. And he was not a man who was sure caught on popular policies. He was not a man who would go into a nice gentle cell of policies. With the result that the budget McEntee introduced in 1952 was one of the most severe budgets in this state prior to the 2008 crash. What McEntee decided to do was he was going to curb spending, both government and personal. If you curb government spending and personal spending, people will then not be spending money on imports. And the economy will stabilize. That was the theory. So he introduced his budget in 1952. Income tax went up. Taxes on tobacco, alcohol, and petrol were stiff. Subsidies on food were cut. The government had been subsidizing foods since the 1940s. The result was this, the country went deeper into recession and by 1953 the situation was very serious. No surprise, in 1954 Fianna Fáil was talked out of power. And the second inter-party government came into office. The Taoiseach was Johnny Costello. 
He was the head of state for the next three years, from 54 to 57. Now, the problems facing the inter-party government were precisely the same as the policies face, the problems facing Fianna Fáil. And the inter-party government was made up of three parties. Fine Gael, Labour, and Clonatolu. Clonatolu was a farmer's party based in the west of Ireland. They didn't have many deputies, but they brought up the numbers. The government, which met for 54 to 57, again had to face these extremely serious problems. And the Minister for Finance, Gerard Sweetman, introduced a budget which was practically the same as the budget which Fianna Fáil had introduced. There was no difference. <coughs> economic cutback, economic austerity. We would use the term austerity in this day and age. That was seen to be the solution to the problem. This was the only way of tackling it. It was the, prob it was the solution very much favoured by the Department of Finance. The problem was this. The problems in Ireland deepened. They worsened. Nothing was improving. And on the political merry-go-round, Fianna Fáil was back in office in 1957, yet again. And as you can see, the 57 photograph doesn't look an awful lot different. And if you were a person living through the time, and many of us lived through the time, it wasn't that cheerful, you know? There were a few new faces. Well, I thought there were a few. Here's Brian Lennon, he's somewhere there. Where's Brian Lennon? There he is. Right? He got in. And there's Kevin Boland. This myth, by the way, that De Valera was a ruthless political operator is a heap of rubbish. De Valera was not a ruthless political operator in many levels. De Valera wanted to get rid of Kevin Boland's father. What's his name now? Jerry. Jerry, Jerry Boland. But Dave said, how could I fire poor Jerry Boland? Jerry wasn't any good at there because De Valera. How did I get rid of him? Brilliant solution. Brilliant solution. He said to Jerry, Jerry, you've got to go. But listen, we bring your son in in the state. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry walked out and Kevin walked in. Yeah. Okay, the very first day in the door. And that was that was De Valera's solution to the problem. The difficulty was that again the government was back facing the same problems. And in 1950, the Minister for Finance, Jim Ryan, in the first government, the first budget introduced by that government did exactly the same as the other government had done and been afforded. There was no apparent change. But actually, there was. There was the beginning of change. Significant beginning of change. Because if other members of the government were willing not to do a bit of thinking, there was one minister who had begun to realise this can't go on. This really can't go on. And that was Sean. Lamas. Lamas had used the second period in opposition from 54 to 57 to do some really serious thinking. And he felt we've got to do things differently. Now Lamas, Lamas was very blunt. Was very, very blunt. There was a discussion of ministers apparently. Why were people leaving the country? And you had the usual thing, the adventurous spirit of the <laughs> yes. the, the desire to see the rest of the world, yes. and all of this. And the masses' contribution was, they're leaving because well, they have no jobs. If you want to keep them in the country, we've got to provide jobs. And the mass was even more blunt when he more or less said, if this country is to justify itself, if we are to justify an independent state, a sovereign state, we have actually got to be able to give our people work. And the mass began reflecting on that. He began thinking as to what the, react, what the response should be, what the government should do to deal with this situation. And on the 1st of October, 1955, he addressed a feeder for a meeting in Cleary's Ballroom in Dublin. And at that, in that address, he made a number of observations. Fianna Fáil, he said, has accepted that the economic program it initiated 25 years ago has not been sufficient to bring about economic and social progress. 
the kind of economic and social progress we desire and which we believe needs to be accomplished. Now, just stop here a moment. He is telling the Fianna Fáil party, we, you know, we're not, we're not, decode all this. What he's telling the Fianna Fáil party is, we're not delivering the goods. We haven't delivered the goods. And we've got to start delivering them. He said at that meeting, what now needs to be done is this. We have to have a proper developmental, economic and social program that creates jobs. And Lamas pointed out, we have to look to industry, not to agriculture. Now this was a huge, huge mind shift. Not change of attitude. Because Ireland up to now was primarily agriculture. Sean Lamas was saying, we've got to look to industry. And this was a major, major change. But, as it happens, there was another person thinking on the same lines. The Department of Finance had a new secretary, T.K. Whittaker. T.K. Whittaker was appointed by Gerald Sweeten. And there he was, took up his position as secretary, the most powerful civil servant in the state would have been the secretary of the Department of Finance in those days. Our friend Whitaker was not happy with the way things were going, nor were a number of key civil servants in the Department of Finance. And Whitaker, Whitaker's argument was this, as Secretary of the Department, we have a patriotic duty to get Ireland out of this fix. We cannot allow the country to continue as it is. We have got to start doing some original thinking. We've got to get, get in our, start getting our head around this particular problem. And that is precisely what Whitaker set about doing. We're told that as Whitaker was going, there's a story that Whitaker was on his way to a conference in Washington. And these ideas were spinning around in his mind. He bought a magazine, Dublin Opinion, to read on the plane. And this was the cartoon on the front page of that particular magazine. Here's Ireland visiting fortune teller. And Ireland is commenting, get to work. They are saying I have no future. And Whitaker apparently came back. That cartoon really kind of galvanized that this country needs to start seriously looking at, his, at where it's going to go. He jotted down his ideas. He put them together, which was significant. And his ideas were to be published in a document called Economic Development. Now, what was very unusual about this particular document is this. It outlined Whitaker's analysis of the economic problems facing the state and the solution to those problems. What is most unusual, unique about this document is this. The cabinet, prompted by Le Mans, stated or decided it would be published, but it would be published under the name of the Secretary of the Department of Finance. That was most unusual. A document like that comes out under the name of a civil servant. They're meant to be anonymous, as you know, civil servants. Lamas felt, listen, we've got to start thinking outside the box here. And I think it's, a, it's, an, inter it's an interesting document. Kind of dull in many ways, you'd expect. But one thing, one thing Whitaker was very good at. Whitaker was very good at getting to the essence of things. And I think when you go through the document, there's one paragraph that really stands out. After 35 years of native government, people are asking whether we can achieve an acceptable degree of economic progress. The common talk among people in the towns as in rural Ireland, is of their children having to emigrate as soon as their education is completed in order to be sure of a reasonable livelihood. To the children themselves and to many already in employment, the jobs available at home look unattractive by comparison with those obtained in such variety and so readily elsewhere. And that summed it all up. The government was to produce a programme for economic expansion in October of 1958. And that began laying the foundations for what we might call the modern Irish economy. 
And the key idea in this was we have got to attract foreign investment if we're going to actually begin the process of providing a decent standard of living for our people. And that can only be done through tax incentives. So you're talking now about the Irish state acknowledging that agriculture cannot solve the problems out. And what we've got to do is bring in direct foreign investment. That's the only way we can solve the problem and provide jobs. And the actual document itself is quite clear in economic expansion. In our present circumstances, we must be prepared to take risks under all entities, social, commercial, financial, and we are to succeed in the driving for expansion. We've got to do that. I think this entire process, this entire process was fast-tracked by Lamas. Lamas took control of the situation. De Valera's input to this was nil, nil by all accounts. And Lamas said that himself. There was no input by De Valera. As Tarnishta, Lamas pushed the whole thing forward, determined that something would be achieved. And Stating priorities for investment, the state could now begin the process of development. Just a side track here a moment. Probably one of the most remarkable public servants the state ever produced. A truly remarkable public servant. A very long life, died at 101. Born on 8th of December 1916 in County Down. Grew up in Drogheda. In 1956, at 39 years of age, he became the Secretary of the Department of Finance. He was picked over other people who thought they should have the position. With the Mass and other ministers and other civil servants, he produced the outline for economic progress in the state. Not just that, he was to be a key figure with the Mass from 59 to 66 in improving relations with Northern Ireland. He became governor of the Central Bank in 69, a position he held until 1976. In 2001, he was voted the, the, the Irish man of the 20th century. And in 2002, he was given, he was voted the greatest living Irish person. I think a clear recognition of the fact that he was an architect of modern Ireland. But, there was one thing he was clear about. And I think, in an age actually, when I think there's just a complete lack of vision sometimes, our friend was very clear as to what all this was about. Let us remember that we are not seeking economic progress for purely materialistic reasons, but because it makes possible relief of hardship and want, the achievement of a better social order, the raising of human dignity, and eventually the participation of all who were born in Ireland in the benefits, moral and cultural, as well as material, of spending their lives and bringing up their families in Ireland. I think that is actually inspirational. I haven't seen anything quite inspirational for a very long time. It truly is. This is a vision of a society, not of an economy. <coughs> Quite a remarkable man. And just if you thought things were bad enough in the state, things got worse. The IRA became active again. There was an IRA campaign in the 1950s. After World War II, the IRA was on its knees. De Valera had crushed, absolutely crushed the IRA by 1945. Then in 1949, there was the Declaration of the Republic, and the British government passed the Government of Ireland Act, which stated that Ireland would remain partitioned for as long as the Unionists in the North wished to be so. This gave rise to a very serious tension within the state. An anti-partition campaign started up. There was popular acceptance of a narrative now the six counties were occupied. And there was another simple fact, and it was this. You have a lot of young men with nothing to do, with nothing to do, totally disillusioned with the economic system in the state and the social system in the state. 
And rather than waste their time as they saw it, they joined the IRA. And on the 12th of December 1956, the IRA launched Operation Harvest. That is, to drive the British out of Northern Ireland. On New Year's Day, 1957, two IRA volunteers were killed, attacking an RUC station. One was Sean Salt, a name will be recognised to a lot of you, and the other guy was a guy called Fergal O'Hanlon. He's only a boy. He's only a boy at the end of the day. The two of them were killed attempting to destroy an RUC post up in Northern Ireland. And there was a massive outpouring, a massive outpouring of support for the IRA. Sean South's funeral became a huge public display. A massive display as his cortege moved through Dublin. Similar for Fergal O'Hanlon up in the north, he was buried in Fermanagh. <coughs> the situation was, to say the least, now, Costello's government couldn't take hard action against the IRA for the very simple reason he was dependent on the vote of some independent deputies who were Republican. Right? <laughs> when de Valera got back into power in 57, he smashed them again. Ruthlessly took action against the IRA. And within two years, the IRA again was in a weakened state. But I think it's good to end on a somewhat optimistic note. Because in a decade in which Ireland was kind of wallowing almost in self-pity, understandably why, we all understand why, in a decade when the country was, to say the least, things were not going well, Ireland began the process of looking outwards. We actually began looking outwards. In 1946, in 1946, sorry, 1945 rather, the 24th of October 1945, the UN came into formal existence. The first public indication of Irish interest in the recently founded UN came in July 1946, when De Valera tabled a motion in the Doyle expressing Irish agreement with the principles of the Charter of the UN, and recommending that we should join the United Nations. The British actually supported us. Remember that you might surprise us, given the fact that we hadn't supported them in World War II. The Americans were, they'd support us. The Russians, <coughs> no, no. The Irish would not join us. The Irish, the Russians vetoed Irish application for membership on the basis that Ireland was nothing more than a puppet of the West. In 1956, sorry, in 1955, Ireland was excluded until there was a package deal arranged that so many states from the East under Soviet control and so many from the West disposed towards America and Britain could enter the United Nations. And that's precisely what we did. Uh, John McCarthy, this is this. Uh, next slide, that's grand. The first session of the UN had been on the 10th of January 1946 in London. And eventually, on the 14th of December 1955, we entered the United Nations. We were beginning to take our place, beginning to look over. And it was, as I said, a very important occasion for the Irish. Small states like Ireland don't have many outlets to uh, express themselves. The United Nations gave an opportunity. Here's my recognition. There's Ian Cosgrave. He was Minister of Foreign Affairs at that particular time. I don't know some of the others. Freddie Bowen. Freddie Bowen, of course, is there. It's the First Lady, you showed him. That's the First Lady, yeah. yeah. And I don't know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is the First Lady that's appeared in the slide through the entire thing. And actually, look, that tells the story of the self dome I think. But this was significant. Ireland was now about to take her place among the nations of the earth. You will remember, some of you, the words spoken by 
Robert Emmett at his speech in Dublin in Green Street Court House in 1803. When my country shall take her place on the nations of the earth, then and only then shall I have the time And I always remember that because I can remember in school in 1969, this, we had done this speech of Emmett from the dock, and the brother teach us wanted to know. Could Ireland now take its place among the nations of the earth? There was a moment of silence. An Egypt here decided to <laughs> Up, I put my hands. And I said, yes, we can now take our place among the nations of the earth. After all, we're members of the UN. We're brave. <laughs> that was not the correct answer. <laughs> It was not the correct I was looked at with a sense of pity, and it was pointed out that we were occupied, six counties were still occupied. How could we then take our place among the nations of the earth? And the final sentence was this. He looked at me and he said, I am sad to think that a boy I educated can speak what this was. That was that. So it was actually an interesting time, an interesting period. And I do think actually we can, when we come to the very end of the 1950s, we can at least say two things. It was a very difficult decade. But it was also a decade in which shall we say, the seeds were beginning to be sown. The seeds towards what we would now recognize as a modern Ireland. And it actually, I suppose, became encapsulated or incarnated in a sense when we put Sean Mass's tenure as Taoiseach from 59 to 66. That is why, I mean, Sean Mass and, I suppose, Whitaker were to be a remarkable partnership. And there are a number of people I genuinely think who deserve great credit. I finally will just tell you when I was in school teaching in the the Mercy, I always I said to the, I said to my students that really the, the school hall should have three sorry four portraits in it. Four portraits. One Constance Markovich, yeah. a reminder to the young girls of the first woman to sit in the soil of Dolly, the first minister. The second person who should be there is TK Whitaker. A reminder of the importance of public service in terms of public, in terms of the civil service. The third portrait I always felt should be Whitaker to represent, or perhaps, no, sorry, I said I said Whitaker. So the third one should be Sean the Mass or or our friend Donna O'Malley. One or the other. That, those, that should be the, the those should be the three portraits. And the fourth portrait I declared to them with great enthusiasm should be the portrait of our school principal. On the basis that I'm a terrible nick. <laughs> I'm really, I must have ingratiated myself. <laughs> anyway, an interesting portrait of De Valera looking into the middle distance. It was taken in government buildings around 57 or 58. Particularly appropriate photograph of a man who must have been dwelling upon, it, must have been reflecting on his political future at this stage. Where, what, where to go next, what to do next, what to happen next. That will bring us next week to De Valera's resignation as Pichoc and the story surrounding that and how eventually this person who had really run the state who had been the dominant political figure, gave up political power. And let it be said, like any politician who is around a long time, it takes a hell of an effort to prize out any political leader.
It takes a normal effort. And it took an enormous effort to dislocate in the Devonera. Next week, we'll look at Devonera and government. Thank you. downstairs. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you.